Hello, I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Comage, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. Today, we find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. We continue on this journey that we are heading towards Jerusalem, and Jesus is bringing to us some of his parables. And we continue on this week um, with parables, as we had parables last week, too. We find ourselves in Pentecost 15. Our commentary uh, today is by Lois Malcolm of 2013 from workingpreacher.org. So let's go ahead and uh, let's get started. If you're familiar with the Gospel of Luke, you'll see that um, there are always some puzzling, puzzling teachings of Jesus, right? And usually they come in the form of a parable, not always, but oftentimes. And this to me is a puzzling parable. It's one that I think will make us all scratch our heads. And when you hear it, I'm sure that you've heard it before and you'll go, oh yeah, that parable. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at Luke chapter 16, verses one through 13. I hope your Bibles are open and ready, but if not, you can follow along on the screen. Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat, he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended him, the dishonest manager, because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. Whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If you then have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So as we listen to that parable and look at it, and maybe even perhaps stop and read it again, we might ask ourselves, why this parable? And, and why is this parable stuck within uh, this section of the Gospel of Luke? As we listen to the story itself, kind of sounds contemporary. A dishonest manager is about to lose his job because he has misspent his employer's assets. Because he doesn't want to do manual labor or receive charity, he goes around to all the people who owe his employer money and reduce their debts. He does this so that they will be hospitable to him after he loses his job. To our surprise though, the employer commends the dishonest manager with his shrewdness. Why is he commended? And why does Luke include this story in the gospel? So let's take a look at our dishonest manager here. He does something with the rich man's wealth that reverses the existing order of things. If we remember, one of the things that Luke is very famous for, and perhaps um, we almost in the in the past sermons that we've had in the past few months, really have pointed out the reversals in the Gospel of Luke and how Jesus turns things upside down. And Luke really does a great job of pointing that out to his audience. So if we look at this Gospel, we can see that reversals of status are at the heart of what happens when Jesus and the kingdom of God appear. The proud are scattered, the powerful are brought down, and the lowly lifted. The hungry are filled, and the rich are sent away empty. But why does the employer commend the dishonest manager for being shrewd? Of course, 
His commendation could be ironic. But if it's not ironic, then why is the manager being commended? Some commentators have suggested that the manager has reduced his own commission in the debts owed and that this is what is being commended. Yet others have suggested more generally that the employer is simply commending the manager for responding shrewdly to a difficult circumstance. Perhaps as I look at some of these possibilities, I really look at the first one um, as some of the commentators have suggested that the manager has reduced his own commission in the debts owed and that that is what is being commended. Um, I'd never really thought of that before and maybe maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe that is actually what's happening. And if so, I think that really kind of uh, tends to make a little more sense. There's a couple of possibilities uh, as to what the dishonest manager um, is doing or what Jesus is trying to tell us through the dishonest manager. First, the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. In other words, Jesus' disciples, often referred to as children of light, could learn something about acting prudently from the children of this age. Second, what they could learn from the children of this age has to do with making friends for themselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that those new friends might welcome them into the eternal homes. Instead of using dishonest wealth to exploit others as the rich do, the disciples are to use wealth to make friends for themselves. If friendships are based on reciprocal and egalitarian relationships, then releasing other people's debts not only enriches them, but also establishes a new kind of reciprocity with them. Here are a few more possibilities. There's a connection between being faithful or dishonest with very little and very much. How one deals with dishonest wealth and what belongs to another says much about how one will deal with true riches and what is your own. How we use the resources at our disposal in this life, especially in tight circumstances, matters, even though our true riches can only be found in that place where no thief can draw near and no moth destroys. Finally, the capstone to all of this is that no slave can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. This reiterates the central theme in Luke. The kingdom of God entails giving up all other commitments, including commitments to economic security. These texts cannot just be spiritualized. Luke is talking about a different way of using wealth. Our wealth belongs to God and is to be used for the purposes of God's reign among us, and not simply for our own interests. So let's look at a couple of questions. Why is our dishonest manager shrewd? Even though he is still sinner, who is looking out for his own interests, he models behavior the disciples can emulate. Instead of simply being a victim of circumstance, he transforms a bad situation into one that benefits him and others. By reducing other people's debts, he creates a new set of relationships based not on the vertical relationship between leaders and debtors, rooted in monetary exchange, but on something more like the reciprocal and egalitarian relationships of friends. So what does this dishonest manager set into play? Well, this dishonest manager kind of sets into motion what happens when the reign of God emerges among us. Old hierarchies are overturned and new friendships are established. Indeed, outsiders and those lower down on hierarchies now become the very ones we depend upon to welcome, not only in their homes in this life, but even in the eternal homes. Just a couple more questions for us to think about. And uh, again, this is these are just some thoughts. I have some different thoughts on this too that um, will hopefully come out in Sunday's sermon. But this parable here leads me um, thinking about a lot of different things. So I want to ask you, what do you find the most confusing about this parable? Perhaps I think the most confusing thing is really when we look at it in its first read, how it seems to depict that being dishonest is okay. Now, as we got further into it and started understanding it a little bit more, it seemed to make 
a little more sense, not about dishonest being okay, but um, how Jesus is trying to show his disciples that maybe you have to be shrewd at times um, and, and look at things a little bit differently for the furthering of God's kingdom. Have there been times in your life when you can identify with the dishonest manager? Perhaps you've been put in situations that um, kind of backed you into a corner that were similar to this dishonest manager. Or maybe um, you worked for a company and you were heavily dependent upon them because they were helping pay for your college. And then you find out something about the company and how they um, use child labor in another country or, or something like that, that really causes to upset you and realize that, well, maybe I don't need to be working for this, co this company because of how they treat others. Those are always difficult decisions to make, right? And, and difficult things to think about. So I hope that you spend some time meandering in the word, that you have some time to reread this parable again, and that as you read it again, that um, the spirit may enlighten you as to what um, God is trying to tell us through this parable this week. Blessings to you on your journey.